I'm Pete. I'm Stephanie, and this is The Cool Part Show, our show all about interesting, unusual 3D printed parts. We're not in our normal studio. We are in Indiana, just minutes away from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. We're here to talk about this top frame. This is a part used in IndyCar racing that is now so important that it is mandated on all of the cars. The 3D printed top frame. We're going to find out why it's so important to IndyCar race cars, why it had to be made through additive manufacturing on this episode of The Cool Parts Show. This episode of The Cool Part Show is brought to you by Carpenter Additive. We're at the company's powder production facility in Athens, Alabama. Specifically, we are standing on top of the Z1, the company's largest vacuum atomizer for producing metal powders. Want to know how to make metal powder for additive manufacturing? Stick around after the episode. Welcome to The Cool Part Show on location. Thank you for watching. If you like the show, please subscribe. We have a new newsletter, The Cool Parts Show, all access, extra segments just for subscribers. Today we're bringing you a part from the world of IndyCar racing. This 3D printed top frame is a safety component that's used on these cars. But first, we're coming to you from the Dallara IndyCar factory. Dallara is an Italian engineering and manufacturing company. They're headquartered in Italy, but they have this second location here near Indianapolis. Right now, we're actually in Speedway, Indiana. We're about a mile away from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Dallara builds and assembles race cars. Race cars for the IndyCar series. Uh, an IndyCar racer obviously has a lot of components. Some components are installed by the individual race teams, but we're going to talk about a part that is a standard component of every single car in that series. That's right. This top frame is a newer addition to the IndyCar. It was mandated as of the 2020 season, and it sits sort of in front of and above the driver's head to protect him or her in a couple of different ways. Its primary purpose is to hold the aero screen, which is a strong windshield that protects the driver from any debris that might be coming up off the track, coming off of other cars. And then it also acts as a sort of a roll cage in case of an accident. So this is a very important component of the car. The, the top frame is this entire piece you see here, except for these thin little assembly brackets that have been added on. It's titanium. It was made through additive manufacturing initially because of the very fast development time for this part. Tight time frame from initial conception through to final production. But as we're going to hear, because this was made through 3D printing, there were opportunities to refine the design later after it had gone into production to the point that the latest iteration of this component is a superior part to what was initially introduced. But first, IndyCar. This is a special racing series with a particular connection to manufacturing. That's right. You may have seen other 3D printed parts for racing, uh, but most of the examples that have been publicized that are out there are things that the teams have developed and created themselves. So they might just be making, you know, maybe one or two for use on the car for a season. In IndyCar racing, the cars are much more standardized than in some of the other series. And so there are components like, for instance, this top frame that get made in higher quantities because they're going to be used by every team on every car. That's what makes IndyCar distinctive, this connection that it has to production. To talk about that, here's Tino Belli. He is Director of Aerodynamic Development for IndyCar. IndyCar is the uh, sanctioning body of the uh, NTT IndyCar World uh, Racing Series. Uh, it's a 17 race series, the most famous race is of course the Indianapolis 500. So IndyCar is uh, an open wheel uh, racing series. We race on uh, road and street tracks. Uh, but what really distinguishes us from any other racing series is that we then also race on ovals. So we race on short ovals like Milwaukee and Iowa, uh, which are one mile or less. And we also race on super speedways like Indianapolis, which is uh, two and a half miles, very, very high speed, you know, average lap speed of 230 miles an hour or more. We're quite strong on keeping a lot of the car standard uh, because of the economics. Um, at the end of the day, uh, racing is a competitive series, but it's also an entertainment business. Part of the quality of entertainment is a car count. We have to try and keep the number of cars up so that people are uh, always seeing action on the track. And we don't want anybody uh, running away and uh, winning every race. So if we keep the cars fairly close together, 
it comes down to uh, quality of the drivers, quality of the teams in their pit stops and how they set up the car rather than uh, making a huge technological advance, which uh, nobody else can keep up with if they can't afford to keep up with it. We encourage the little guys to be able to uh, have a chance of winning some races. So this is a really big deal. Prior to 2020, the drivers wore helmets, but they didn't have anything on the front of the car to do exactly what this top frame does. And drivers have been seriously injured. You can think of all the things that might go wrong when you're out on the track. So the addition of the top frame and the aero screen that it supports was a big jump forward in terms of driver safety. And other series have sort of dealt with a similar problem in similar ways, like you might have seen the Formula One halo. Uh, IndyCar decided to take a little bit of a different approach. As you can imagine, uh, at the Indy 500, where you're traveling uh, at over 230 miles an hour, the aerodynamics of the top frame and the windscreen is quite important. Uh, so um, let's compare our top frame with the halo. The halo is basically a bent tube around the driver's head. Our, our shapes are more elliptical, more airfoil type shapes. So uh, the top frame was quite quite a complex and challenging part to uh, manufacture. IndyCar recognized it was a big deal once they saw the need for this component and they moved quickly on getting it developed. The project, the Top Frame Aero Screen project was very, very short just gestation. It started in May of 2019 and we had it on track here at Indianapolis in uh, October. 2019. We contracted uh, Red Bull Advanced Technologies to uh, be the main design contractor for the top frame, the aero screen and the uh, composite structure that had to be added uh, to the monocoque for the top frame. Our other partners, of course, is Delara, who is our um, main manufacturer of the race car. They really did uh, the aerodynamic work, the CFD and the wind tunnel work to make sure that the top frame and aero screen uh, integrated well into the car. And then finally, we contracted with uh, Aerodyne, which is a composite company here in Indianapolis, who actually did the composite lower frame, which bonds to the uh, cockpit opening, uh, which the top frame and the aero screen attach to. So aerodynamics and strength were major concerns in the development of this top frame, but it also had to integrate into the car design that already exists. Here to talk about that is Dominic Coffey. He is a design engineer and project manager here at Delara USA. So the design of the top frame is driven by the architecture of the monocoque that it sits on. So a lot of the end conditions were driven by the size of the cockpit that the driver sits in. So we had to maintain that envelope for the driver to ingress and egress from the car. So that kind of drove the, the top conditions of the, the frame. The front conditions of the frame and the windscreen were driven by the suspension that the car already had. So it's very close to the uh, spring and damper setup of the front suspension. So that drove how far the frame and screen could go forward. So all of this back and forth ultimately led to this kind of wishbone design that can hold the aero screen, uh, doesn't interfere with anything else on the car, and it's still wide enough that you can get the driver out in case of an emergency. But when it came time to actually manufacture this thing, there were a whole new set of challenges to contend with. Three methods of manufacturing were considered like a, a, a straight fabrication, uh, casting, and um, 3D printing. 3D printing really came through because we could get the shapes and the wall thicknesses and everything that we wanted more easily than than casting and fabrication just plain wasn't going to work right from the beginning. So these top frames are 3D printed and assembled in Austria at a company called Pankel, which is a supplier to the automotive and motorsports industries. Here is Stefan Seidel, the CTO of Pankel Racing Systems. More than 10 years ago, Pankel Racing Systems decided to introduce additive manufacturing to a already vast machining portfolio. It enabled us to create designs and products that had not been possible before, and hence it's a very interesting addition uh, and enables us to push the limits wherever we can. The time frame for this whole project initially was very tight. Therefore, we had to look at design and produ production methodologies 
that enabled us to have the first prototypes on the car very, very fast. 3D printing is the ideal production method for this, and that's why it was for us the only choice to go this route. The 3D printing method is laser powder bed fusion. The top frames are produced on an additive manufacturing machine from EOS. This top frame is way larger than the build chamber of that machine. To enable one build cycle to produce one top frame, the part is split into five different pieces that can nest together into a more compact build, welded together afterwards to produce the solid part, Pankel manufactured one top frame per IndyCar this way, actually manufactured more than that. The original top frame, we produced 66 of them. And the reason we produced 66 is uh, we have 33 cars uh, at the Indianapolis 500. So we needed one for each car and every car has a spare. So we just doubled it to 66. And those 66 top frames come here to Delara. This is where assembly happens. Here's Dominic again to talk about what happens once the top frames arrive. When we get the top frame from Pangle, it's in an uncoated condition. So we sand it down, we paint it, and then we install some composite, what we call Z brackets on the frame that the windscreen attaches to. So the top frame is fastened to the monocoque with 14 fasteners. There are six at the front leg of the top frame, just in front of the driver. There are four immediately next to the driver's head, two on each side. And then there are four back to the monocoque roll hoop. So IndyCar has been running the same monocoque since 2012. At the time, we were wanting to retrofit the tubs that the teams had. So there was a lot of work going into optimizing it to fit what was already there which led into some, a lot of work being done with working with the tolerances of the monocoques. So this part has been a success, not just on the track, but even before it got to the track in IndyCar's testing. We low tested the top frames. Obviously the, the top frame was designed with FEA analysis. Um, and then we made a fixture uh, at Cranfield Impact Center in the UK. And we loaded up the top frame to 150 kilonewtons, which is about six Chevy Silverado trucks. Um, none of the top frames actually failed uh, up to that load. So uh, they also didn't take a permanent deformation. So those top frames have actually been on race cars for the last three years as well. The only time we've damaged a top frame is when a car gets uh, upside down, inverted, on the track and the titanium rubs away in the asphalt. A great advantage to it has been that previously, um, if that had happened, we would have rubbed away through the uh, carbon fiber of the monocoque cockpit opening and um, that's irreparable. So uh, all of the monocoques that have been in accidents like this have actually um, stayed uh, in commission and continue to race, whereas in the past they would have been uh, scrapped. So in the long run, the top frame has saved us a significant, or saved the teams a significant amount of money. So the top frame has been very successful, but the manufacturing partners involved with this part recognized it could be made better. So back to 3D printing, back to additive manufacturing as the means of producing this part. We heard Stefan describe why additive was chosen initially? It's because of the fast development time for this part. The, the idea was conceived in May and it was on race cars on the track in October. It went that fast. It got into production that fast, but once it was in production and once it was proven on the cars, there was the opportunity at that point, because it was made through 3D printing, to step back and bring in some of the other advantages that additive manufacturing can, can bring to the possibilities for a part like this. With all our experience on the design, on the simulation, on the material, as well as on the production side of the top frame, we decided to have another go and to optimize all the first top frame as far as possible. In the second generation, our goal was to further optimize the design and to reduce the weight and offer also a commercial benefit because in additive manufacturing, reduced volume, reduced weight 
also means reduce cost because there's less volume to be printed, less material used. So we could offer the IndyCar and all its customers an optimized version at reduced cost. We use topology optimization as well as several simulation tools in the additive manufacturing to really get the optimum out of both worlds because you always need to consider material, process and design uh, in order to get the optimal out of the uh, performance. So Penkel, Delara, IndyCar have been working on the second generation of these top frames, uh, which have been further optimized. They're gonna be about seven pounds lighter and they're gonna be going onto the cars as of the 2024 season. That's important because it also coincides with a new change in racing. Uh, the IndyCars are going to a hybrid engine. And so there have been a lot of efforts to remove weight out of the car overall. The redesigned top frame is going to contribute to that. All right, let's wrap this up. This is an IndyCar top frame, relatively new component of IndyCar race cars. It protects the driver. It protects in the event of a rollover. It protects against objects that might be flying toward the car on the course. It was made through additive manufacturing initially because this component was developed quickly, brought into production quickly. It's made through laser powder bed fusion. This top frame is titanium. It is 3D printed in five pieces, which are then welded together, machined, painted, before being assembled onto the cars here at Delara USA. Uh, the first generation of this top frame was pretty lightweight already, but the second generation is coming for the 2024 season. That's seven pounds lighter. It's going to help uh, reduce the weight of the car, which is really important as these cars switch over to hybrid engines. I want to say thank you to Pankel and IndyCar for sharing this story with us. A big thanks to Delara for letting us film in their facility. Yes, big thank you to everyone who helped us out for this episode. If you like the show, you want to see more of The Cool Part Show, find all of our episodes at thecoolpartshow.com and on our YouTube channel. And if you really like the show, sign up for our all-access newsletter. This month, subscribers got to see an exclusive extra about one of the other 3D printed components that are going to be used on IndyCars soon. So you can see that too and sign up at thecoolpartshow.com slash all-access. If you have a story of a cool part you want to share with us, the way IndyCar shared the story of this top frame, email us, coolparts at additivemanufacturing.media. It might become an episode of the show. Thanks for watching. This episode's brought to you by Carpenter Additive. We are at the company's powder production facility in Athens, Alabama, and we are standing on top of an atomizer. The Z1 is Carpenter Technologies' largest vacuum atomizer, and it is the heart of the process for making additive manufacturing metal powder here at Carpenter Additive. This facility is capable of producing up to 18,000 pounds of metal powder per day. Plant manager Jordan Ralph talked us through the process. So an atomizer is a piece of equipment that uh, is capable of melting and pouring molten metal into the stream of high pressure um, gas. Uh, that turns that molten metal into tiny, tiny droplets that ultimately cool and form uh, our powder, which looks like uh, gray dust. So to start our process and the uh, ultimate end-to-end -end solution that we have here, um, we bring in raw materials um, all the way down to individual elements, so nickel, cobalt, chrome, um, moly, niobium. We bring all of those raw materials into the shop. We utilize those materials uh, to build charges that go into the uh, atomizer. Um, as you walk that flow path, you run through uh, our charge makeup area uh, where all of the materials are weighed out um, in very exact uh, quantities. Uh, that ensures that we're able to hit our customer specifications uh, and hold the tight tolerances that we're looking for on a chemistry perspective. Um, from there, the material is flown to the top of the atomizer and charged into the furnace. As the material is produced, it's poured out and is collected at the bottom of the atomizer. Uh, the material is then uh, taken and transferred into a bulk container uh, for processing through the rest of the uh, value stream. The next stop for any of our as atomized powder would be uh, the screener. Uh, so that will remove the coarse portion of the uh, um, powder. Uh, from there, we take it through air classification. It takes the fine portion of the uh, particle size distribution out and makes the uh, final cut for uh, an additive material, like a 10 to 45. 
From there, we stack up all of those individual lots and put them into the 12,000 pound blender uh, to make the single homogenous blends. Um, at that point, we are able to pack in any configuration that the customer is looking for, whether that be drums, bottles, um, powder trace hoppers. You know, we've got a lot, of, a lot of options to meet customers' needs there. The atomization capability and all of the powder um, capabilities gives us a unique um, you know, position where we're actually able to uh, produce the powder, run testing uh, through additive machines, all the way through hip and heat treat, um, do final testing on those products and then make additional changes or um, try to optimize you know, things like our uh, chemistry or sizing so that we uh, ultimately can uh, serve our customers better.